Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good to see everyone. I want to thank everyone who was involved in so many acts of kindness while my son Dalton was uh, in the hospital. We appreciate that so much. He's back at the group home now, and well, he's running the place <laughs> right now, so he's, he's, he's a lot better, but thank you so much. You know, we use terms in religion that we're familiar with, but a lot of the world, they don't even know what we're talking about. So we have to be careful unless we just are speaking into the air. One of the terms that we often use is the word gospel. You might think everybody knows what that means. I didn't know for years. Nobody told me. Gospel means good news good tidings. In the ancient world, they were blessed by not having internet or even telephones or newspapers and all that kind of stuff. And so they would have someone get on the street corners and cry out the news. And if he got it wrong, he could pay with his life. So it was a little bit serious that he get the exact message that the king wanted put across. In the Bible, the word gospel is used over and over and over. I love what Paul said in Romans 1.16. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why are you not ashamed, Paul? I am not ashamed of the gospel for it, the gospel, Romans 1.16, is the power of God unto salvation. Under everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So Paul said the gospel is the power of God to save people. That's where God has placed his power to save us from our sins. And Romans 3.23 says, We've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.9 and 10 says, All are under sin, both Jew and Gentile. So we desperately need this gospel. I want you to look at the importance of the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And look at verse 7. Now in these days the church was being persecuted. Wasn't like today in America. Many of them were dying for their faith. Mocked ridiculed, hated, because they believed the gospel. So Paul writes to them and he says, Listen, you who are troubled, these are the ones going through all of these horrible tribulations, you who are troubled, rest with us. 
when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, when I think about everlasting destruction, I don't understand that. That escapes me. Punishment that never ends. I don't, I don't know how to imagine that. Why would this happen? We must understand Psalm 51, 3 and 4. God is the one we have sinned against primarily. It is God. Therefore, God is the only one that can tell us the punishment that is deserved for our sins. I mean, I can't tell you what, a hundred years, two hundred years, five hundred years. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. But God tells us they shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, from all that is good and holy and righteous. Why? Well, look at verse 7 and 8. They didn't know God, and they did not obey the gospel. So that tells me the gospel is not just something to be believed. It's something to be obeyed. It's not just something you say, oh, I believe that. It's something you live every day. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 1. Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. And you can read in Acts 18 verse 8 where Paul went and preached to these people. He says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you received, wherein you stand. Verse 2, by which you are saved, If you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried... And he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 through 4 gives us the foundation facts of the gospel. Almost any course you take in college, there are certain fundamental matters you must understand before you move on. Now if I'd have known that 50 years ago, nobody told me, I'd have got a lot further in college. 
I didn't know that. But there's certain fundamental facts of that particular discipline, whether it be psychology, sociology, whatever, there's certain fundamental facts that are the foundation of that discipline. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15 gives us the fundamental facts of the gospel, the good news that God has sent to man. God sent us a message, and it's a good message. It's a beautiful message. And he tells us right here in this passage the fundamental principles of that message. And what are they? They are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died for our sins. He was buried, and then he rose again according to the Scriptures. That's the fundamental facts of the gospel. Now go back to 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, and it says people will be lost who do not obey the gospel. I didn't get that for a long time. I knew the fundamental facts of the gospel were the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But I didn't understand Jesus already died already buried, he's already been raised, how can I obey that? How can I obey what Jesus did? Well, as a matter of fact, you can't. But 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 says you must if you're going to be saved. Romans 6, 17. Paul writes to the church at Rome. And he says, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Okay, look at that word, form. God is to be thanked that you people obey that form of doctrine. Doctrine just means teaching. They obeyed a form of teaching. What does form mean? That's from the, in the original language, that's from the word that means a pattern. Tupas. You know what men wear on their head when they ain't got any hair left? And they, they still want to look young. They could put a tupas on there. Tupas is the word. And it means a model, a form, a pattern of something. Okay, I can't obey the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I can't do that. But I can, Romans 6, 17, obey a form of that. I can obey a pattern of the death, burial, and resurrection. Well, what was he talking about? All we have to do is go back and read the context. That answers most biblical questions. Go back to the context, Romans 6, verse number 1. He begins that chapter, Romans 6, 1, by saying, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Since we're Christians, can we just do anything we want to so grace gets bigger and bigger? Then you love God more. Shall we continue in our sins that grace may continue to enlarge? 
Look what he said in verse 2. God forbid. We would say a thousand times no. Absolutely not. No way. Do we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 6, 2. No way. God forbid. And then he explains it to us. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are baptized buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The old man, the old person, Paul says, is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Who's freed from sin? That's what all of us need. He that is dead. Well, what does that mean? He just told us in Romans 6, 1 through 5. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead, we walk in newness of life. We died to sin. And came forth to live a new life. The old person is crucified with him. That word crucified means put to death. Verse 7, Romans 6, 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. That's when. Colossians 3, 4. For you are dead... And your life is hid with Christ in God. Isn't that beautiful? Then not only does he explain it to us in these words, he gives us example after example after example in the Bible. Now, how many examples? These are really good until they go out. What time is it? Eleven what? Eleven forty-seven. Oh, ten forty-seven. Oh, we're we're doing great. Thanks, Wayne. Ten forty-seven. I thought you said eleven forty-seven. I thought, oh my, people are gonna start leaving. <laughs> we want to beat the other people to the restaurants, don't we? Okay. They're examples. He explains what it means to obey the gospel. Then God gives us examples. Examples is one of the clearest ways to teach. You tell me something with a lot of words in it, after about the third word, I'm on the mothership already lost you. But you give me an example. This is what I'm talking about. Especially if I can see it, I say, Oh, that's what you meant. Acts 2, 36. The apostles are preaching to those who had Jesus put to death. 
That's a pretty serious crime, isn't it? Have you done anything that bad? I've done some pretty bad things. But I ain't done anything that bad. These people had God's own son put to death. And yet God wants them to hear the gospel. That's how loving a God he is. So they hear it in Acts 2. Look at verse 36. As he concludes that beautiful sermon, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's telling them you're in sin. You killed your own Messiah. You really messed it up. And what do they say? Well, that's not any of your business. I live my life, you live yours. Live and let live. No, they didn't say any garbage like that. Verse 37, when they heard this, when they heard the gospel, they were pricked in their heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're convicted of their sins. And so they asked, what do we do? Verse 38, Then Peter said, said unto them, Just say this little prayer with me. Trust in Jesus as your Savior, and He will save you and give you a new life. Is that what yours says? That's what denominationalism 101 says. Just say a little prayer. They ask what to do. Here would be the time to say, say this little prayer with me. No. He said you got to repent. You got to turn away from your sins. That's a little more difficult than saying a little prayer on a TV screen, isn't it? He said you got to repent. Turn away from your sins. You got to repent. You've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of all your sins. Acts 8 verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached unto them Christ. He didn't preach denominationalism. He preached Christ. And what's it say in verse 12, Acts 8 12? Now when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. So, Holly, this says you have a right to obey the gospel even though you're inferior as a woman in the first century. Not now but in the first century. Now you're equal. <coughs> Men and women, when they heard that and believed it, what'd they do? They didn't say a little prayer. They were immersed. Acts 9, 4 through 6, Saul of Tarsus is on the way to Damascus to persecute Christians. A light shines around him. He falls to the earth and he says, Lord, who art you? Who art thou? He didn't understand. And Jesus said, I am Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. 
And Saul, Acts 9, 4 through 6, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me to do? He didn't say, say a little prayer. He didn't say, trust in the Lord in your heart. He didn't say, accept me as your personal Savior. He didn't say any of that stuff. Go into the city. Verse 6. And you'll be told what you must do. Now most people, if I say to them, you must do this. They might not agree with it, but they understand it. This is Jesus Christ talking. And when he says you must do something, that's imperative. That's a command. Go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The beautiful thing about the Bible in Acts 22, 16, we actually have what it, the words that he was told that he had to do. Acts 22, 16, God sent a preacher to him named Ananias, and he said, why do you tarry? What are you waiting for? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Another example. Acts 16, 14, and 15, a man named Lydia, she was a worshiper of God. She heard these preachers come and preach the gospel. And it says she heard them. That's number one. You have to be willing to hear. If you're not willing to listen, you can't obey the gospel. It says she heard us. And the Lord opened her heart. How did he open her heart? Not in some mysterious way, but through her hearing the word, the word opened up her heart so that she heard all the things that were said by these preachers. And in verse 15, Lydia and her household were baptized. A little further in the chapter, we read about a jailer. And you know what they did to him? It says they preached unto him the word of the Lord. You got to hear the word first. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They preached to him the word of the good Lord. And when he heard the word of the Lord, it says he took them and he washed their stripes. He had beaten them in prison. And can you imagine this hardened Roman soldier takes them to his house and cleans up their wounds that he had inflicted. And he and his household were baptized. In Acts 10, 33, God sent Peter to preach to the Gentiles. Because the gospel is not just for one race. It's not just for Jews. It's for Jews and Gentiles. God sent Peter to preach to the Gentiles. He preached a beautiful sermon to them. And before he preached, look at what they said in Acts 10.33. Immediately, therefore, I sent for thee, and it's good that you have come. And now we are all here present before God to hear all things commanded thee of God. We are here to hear whatever God has to say. 
Now that's an ideal audience. Whatever God says, that's what we want to hear. And in Acts 10, 48, He commanded them. He commanded. Do you know what a command is? He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 10, verse 48. Paul went to the city of Corinth, one of the most wicked cities in the world at that time. They didn't have needles laying around all over the street. Wasn't quite as bad as some of the U.S. cities, but it was bad. But Paul went there to preach. And look what it says in Acts 18, 8. Last part of the verse. Many of the Corinthians hearing, you've got to be able to hear the gospel first, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now think about that. When you believe like they believed in Acts 18, 8, you will do what they did. Or you really don't believe it. When you hear the Word and you hear what it means to obey the Gospel, if you're like these people in Acts 18, 8, when you believe it, you'll do what they did. You'll obey it. You can do that right now. 